Hello, everyone. Um, great to have you here. Uh, we're just going to wait a few minutes for people to attend and people to trickle in. We can see the numbers are nicely trickling in right now. So we're just going to uh, spend a few minutes waiting for those people to get in. So wherever you are in the world, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, so whilst we're waiting for people to arrive, we've got Matthew here with us. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to have an open dialogue of questions. So we're going to have questions coming through within the talk, and that's a, that's at Matthew's request in his sort of interest of openness and diplomacy. So while we're waiting for people to come into the chat, um, into the talk, I would like you to think about some questions you might have for him, but obviously respond to the questions, uh, respond to the stuff that he talks about, and remember just to keep asking questions and. The way you can do that is by hovering over the question mark in the top of the screen. And once you type in a question, it will then come through to us and then we can ask questions. So obviously you respond to what he's saying, um, but we can just do that. So we're just going to wait a few, a couple more minutes just as people come in. You can see people are coming in as and when. And then I'll make a few announcements and just introduce Matthew and then we can crack on with what I can assure you is going to be a very exciting talk uh, with someone who has played a massive part in, in revolutionising uh, ways of uh, artists communicating their work and promoting their work. Um, so we'll just wait a couple more minutes and then we will start. So thank you for attending. So I can confirm that the Q&A is ready. So if you do have any questions that you can think of off the top of your head before this talk starts, while we're waiting for people to come in, uh, people can leave a question, the question mark icon in the questions and comments. So it's a question mark icon if you just hover over that at the top of your screen. OK. OK. So I hope you're all safe and well wherever you're watching from and um, we'll just get started in a minute as I can see people are arriving nicely we're getting people in now so okay so okay cool I think we'll kick off now so first of all welcome and thank you very much for coming I hope this finds you safe and well and that you are looking forward to today's talk as much as I am. Just to reiterate, questions, hover over the question mark in the top bubble. Your questions will then get moderated and appear on the screen. And then what we will have is Matthew will be talking about his work. He will break it into chunks in terms of talking about his work and working on the separate initiatives he works on. And then we will have five, maybe 10 minutes in between those chunks where we can have a Q&A session. So just hover over and ask those questions on the question mark icon. I'd just like to say thanks, first of all, to Steph from Marketing and Events and the IT team at Morley College London for their support in making this event possible. So these talks are in the spirit of the, the historical penny lectures at Morley College London, where Morley Working Men's and Women's Club College was established. So these talks were designed in the early 1880s by philanthropist Emma Cons and her supporters where they took over the Royal Victoria Hall, also known as now the Old Vic, to make affordable lectures to working men and women. So today I'm very excited to say we have Matthew Burrow, Burrows, Matthew Burrows, who is a painter who ran the artist support schemes over the years, most notably recently the artist support pledge, as you might know on Instagram, uh, which he started around about this time last year. So we're going to talk to Matthew in a second. He's right here. So um, the, uh, the the great thing is if you look behind me, this uh, this background I've got on here, this is actually an image from the studios that we have 
at the Chelsea Centre in Morley College, London. So our students from the HE Fine Art Provision have actually been on site because we have enough space for them to socially distance. So they've been on site for, uh, they're in the third week now. And there's enough space to socially distance. So that's been really exciting. Um, and this morning, Matthew actually had some tutorials with our students from the, H -E -N -D, the HND, the HNC, and the BA top up with us at the Chelsea Centre for the Creative Industries, which is part of the Morley College London. You can find more information about these courses on the Morley College website. So, Matthew, I'm going to hand over to you in a minute. So, I know you weren't physically in Chelsea with our students, but you were doing remote tutorials. Um, how were they? And uh, did any themes come up at all? Uh, they, they were good. Yeah, I enjoyed them. Um, themes that came up. Uh, I wouldn't say there was overriding themes. Uh, they were all very different, which I thought was a really healthy sign that they, they seem to have a good sense of their own position and sensibility. Can you hear, can you hear me, Matt? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, good. Yes, they were all they were all very different, but all had a very good sense of who they were, what they were doing, which I think is a very strong thing. Um, and that's something that is often the hardest thing I think to to grasp when you're when you're starting out. So, you know, I'll be talking a little bit about that today, actually, towards the end of the talk, um, about developing your own sense of artistic identity and the challenges in doing that. Uh, and some of the lessons I've learned over the years and how to do that better. Uh, they're all things linked up and I hope that will become clear in the next hour. Thank you, Matt. Um, if you could maybe talk through some of your painting practice, some of your influences, that would be great. Uh, do you want, sorry, do you want me to start the talk now or, or is? Yeah, I think if we, if we start the talk now, that'd be okay. great. Okay, sorry, it wasn't clear, that's uh, my fault. Sorry. Okay, well, let me start properly. <laughs> you'll, you'll find me here in the studio uh, in East Sussex, um, where you'll normally find, me. it's also now the heart of Art Support Pledge, where it all happens. So I'm going to really talk about three different things today. I'm going to talk about my own work, um, what I do day to day. I mean, I, I, I work full time as, as an artist and have done now for over 20 years. Um, I'm also going to talk about Artist Support Pledge, what it is, how it works, um, how it started. And then finally at the end, I'm going to um, talk about I guess sort of a little bit of know-how and wisdom that I've picked up along the along the line to help me survive and to do better as an artist. Uh, it should be quite good fun and um, I hope you get something out of that. Well, just to start really, I, I guess you should know a little bit about me and who I am um, and, you know, where I'm from, if you like. Well, I, I grew up in, in the north of England, uh, in the Wirral. I went to Birmingham School of Arts to do my BA and to the Royal College of Arts to do an MA in the mid 1990s. Um, I spent some time living and working in America. I've done residencies at Gloucester Cathedral, the National Gallery, uh, various other places. And I've been described as all sorts of things. I've been described as an artist mentor, an educator, uh, a campaigner for the arts, um, even a social philanthropist. I'm also a runner. I'm a, uh, I'm a 
a committed, enthusiastic, long distance endurance runner. So that feeds into what I do and I think that will become clear uh, throughout it. But really, the way I see myself is I'm an artist. That's it. I all of those things I, I bring under the umbrella of being an artist. It's just me trying to be an artist better. So I hope that will become clear over the next hour and you can see how all of this sort of fits together. So I'm starting with um, a painting that isn't one of mine, which you should be able to see on your screen by Albrecht Dürer, the German painter, um, made in 1496. And this painting is usually on show at the National Gallery in London. It's a very small painting. And it's a painting that I've been fairly obsessed with for pretty much the whole of my career. And I've began to understand that actually what this painting is about, how it's made, um, the questions it asks me as a viewer and as an artist have stayed with me and continue to inform the way I think about painting and life generally. So the two images you can see are actually two sides of the same painting. So the image on the left is the front side, which is St. Jerome, an image of St. Jerome in the wilderness. And the image on the right is the reverse of the painting, a mysterious, elusive image painted on the back. And we don't know why this was painted or um, for what purpose, whether it was accidentally on the back of the painting. But there's something about that elusive nature that there's two elements, there's two ways of thinking about painting and two ways of thinking about the way we see the world that have always sort of inspired and uh, engaged me as an artist. And I think really it comes down to the question is, what is reality and how do we see it? What is it we see when we look at the world? And there's an assumption when we use those words that what we mean is a sort of photographic realism. It's what the way the world looks. Whereas I've begun to realize over the years that that really isn't what we see. That's what we think we see. Actually, our sense of reality is multifaceted and complex and elusive. And it's that relationship to that complex sense of reality that I think is where art is always engaged within its subject. So if you look at art throughout human history, really what art is always trying to do is say, this is a response to the, our experience of reality. It is always imperfect. It will never wholly and completely show what that reality is, but it's the response we have at this moment in time. So in a way, this painting or this double painting, it sort of illustrates where I find myself um, as an artist thinking about that. Okay, we have the next slide, please. So these are two of my paintings from uh, about two years ago now. Um, the painting on the left is called Gatescape and the painting on the right is called Vista. They're both oil paint on panel, on a, a plywood panel, which is um, primed with a handmade gesso primer, which I make myself using sort of traditional methods of mixing um, rabbit skin glue with whiting and um, a white pigment. And then whilst it's warm, applying it to um, the surface of the panel. It takes, I put on about sort of eight layers of this and then sand it down. And it makes a very sort of porous um, quality to the surface. It sort of feels very sort of breathable. It's, it's un unlike sort of um, acrylic primers, which I also use, but I very much like this gesso because it, it feels more like skin rather than a sort of plastic bag, if you like. It feels like it can breathe. And I like that sort of, that porosity and that breathability to painting is, is very important to me. And I'll, I'll come to that a bit later. So these are part really of uh, a series of work that started to think about the way we deal with the, with the landscape and nature itself. And there's a, a great quote which I stumbled upon a couple of years ago from Wade Davis, uh, an anthropologist in The Wayfinders, and he says, just as landscape defines character, culture springs from the spirit of place. 
And one of the things that I've begun to believe with painting is that to call something landscape painting actually does it a disservice in a way, you know, that's what I do, because it assumes a relationship to the landscape that is about a sort of a framing of a place, a sort of picturing of it, if you like, putting a, a frame around a view. But that's not really how we experience landscape. It's not how we live in landscape. It's not how we deal with nature. And I think for me, one of the great challenges of our age is to find a way of relating to nature that is productive in a way that creates a fairer relationship both to the social fabric of humanity who live on it, but also to nature itself, that it doesn't strip it of its resources. Now this, of course, we all know this, this is something that is pertinent in politics, but actually I think that it also has to drive how we think about making art and what it is we do when we make an image of something, when we put colours on a surface or shapes next to one another, they reveal something of the values of the community and the culture that make it. So for me, that's become a kind of real challenge in making my work is finding a way of thinking about the landscape that speaks of our interaction with it as a species but also tries to find a way of making it sacred, making it special, making it um, more than a mere resource for my needs, but actually as part of my nature as I am of, of it. You know, human nature and nature are not separate. They are nature and finding a kind of a coalescence between them, I think for me has been a kind of very important thing. So there are a number of issues really in here. It's the idea of, which goes back to the Jura painting again as well, of image and no image. Making a painting that could be of something, but might be of nothing. A kind of absence and presence, a sort of a way of trying to find a relationship between the stories we tell and it's the mythologies around our stories and the practices of ritual and tradition that we develop in in a human eth ethnosphere, if you like, with the way people interact, the way we create cultural identity and the way the world actually is, the way that the land is, the way that nature exists with us or without us. Finding a kind of relationship to that through image, through metaphor, through surface, through the relationship of touch to colour to line to mark. This to me is a kind of painting that is about sort of a tradition that sits within the traditions of St Jerome interestingly. St Jerome was a, a fourth century bishop who actually went to live in the wilderness and by many of today's standards we'd, we'd have called him one of the first sort of mystics of that era. And in mysticism at that period, there was a kind of a terminology that came into being. That there was two ways of thinking about the world. There was the, a cataphatic way, which was about the way we tell stories and create images. And there was an apophatic way, which was about understanding the cosmos through the absence of those things. That actually our ability to speak of things greater than ourselves is so vast that the best we can do is stay silent. And I think that sense of silence is profound and that sense of silence is something that I begin to understand is central and important to how I think about making paintings. It's very easy to fill the space at, at often with noise, but actually what I want to try and do is create a condition where we are in solitude and silence, but present to it, present to solitude and present to silence, I think is a is sort of the ambition of what I think of as, as, as the ambition of my painting. OK, next slide, please. So this is one of the last paintings I did last year before um, our support pledge start, and it's called Sleepscape. Over the over sort of, sort of 2019 and 20, I started to shift the way I thought about making images and paintings. And that shift really came from my understanding of line. That when I draw, 
I of, more often than not draw with lines. And when I move in the landscape, when I'm running, I started to think of my running like drawing, that when I moved across um, the landscape, my movement through it and my movements, you know, the way my feet moved and the lightness of that movement and the way I would move across um, different sorts of terrain really felt like I started to feel like that was a kind of drawing and was using the same kind of sensibility that I use when I make drawing. And one of the sort of revelations I found in my own work, maybe this sort of happened about five or six years ago when I started to realize that being an artist is not separate from being everything else. And that the way you are an artist is the same you are with everything else. So try to do everything the same in a way. Try to manifest your artist self as you do the way you as, as the way you walk down the road or grow plants or the way you cook food or the way you engage with other people. That's all part of your sensibility and your worldview and your relationship to things. So I started to realize that, OK, well, what is that relationship and how do I how do I best manifest it in myself? And I think line became something of a kind of way of me understanding that the rhythm of a line, the pace of it was like the rhythm and the pace of, a, of running. The way you could structure that and then allow it to fall apart and to flow. The way you could think of something that in a way, you know, line is abstract. It doesn't really exist. But it can sort of have a sense of object, a sort of objectivity. It could almost as if you can place it in space. But again, it can also delineate things that can't be seen. So you, a line could delineate the wind moving across a hill. So there's this sort of abstraction of line that's also a sort of intermediary between you and your cultural ideas and your thoughts and feelings, and your stories and the rest of it, and the reality of the world outside, the way you interact with that, the way you interact with other people. Okay, next slide, please. So this painting is called um, Sterno and actually, I actually haven't given the sizes on the painting. So this one is two meters tall by 180 centimeters wide. The, plat the last painting was 200, um, sorry, 180 centimeters tall and 240 centimeters wide. Uh, both of these paintings are oil paint on canvas, which is unusual for me. I hadn't worked on canvas for some time, but I like the ability to shift materials sometimes. I find that the challenge of shifting your relationship to the surface of the painting forces you to adapt not only technically to what you're doing, but also emotionally. It asks a different rhythm of yourself, like running in the landscape. When you run on a hard ground, it's different than running on a soft ground. If you run on sand, it's different than running on tarmac. Um, if you run up a hill that's rocky, it's different than running um, across a field that's ploughed and you have to adapt your rhythm, your pace, your balance, your sense of awareness and curiosity change. And I think that sense of awareness and curiosity are really important in making art. And in a way, I, I sort of think that that's what art does. It makes us curious. It makes us aware. Suddenly it isn't merely yellow, it's yellow. It's that nothing is ever merely anything in art. It forces us to become aware of it and to be to focus on it and to live with it and exist with it without in a way without condemning it, just to be with it. And again, that comes back to that idea of sort of absence and presence or a kind of apoph apophatic way of thinking about um, not speaking of the things that are too grand to be able to speak about, but just to exist in their presence, to live in a way, in sort of to be negative to those things is just to be there. So this painting is called Sterno, and Sterno is a derives from a Latin word which has two meanings, which in a way I, I quite like because they're quite con contrary to one another. In a bodily sense, Sterno means to join together. So it's the origins of the word sternum, the, the breastbone that that joins your ribs together. And in a landscape. Um, topographical sense, it means to scatter um, 
and to spread out. So is this sort of relationship, this almost sort of paradoxical relationship between the body and the land that you're both wanting to join and to scatter at the same time? And that's sort of, the, you know, in many ways, the history of humankind. It's, it's, it's desire to be united with nature, but also to control it and to be able to um, live prosperously on it and through it. So this sort of became sort of analogous for me, to me for painting, that could I create painting that both joined and scattered, that both enabled a sense of unity, but also a sense of diversity. And it, it's based actually on a, a set of drawings I made at the British Museum of uh, a boy taking a sculpture of a boy taking a thorn out of his foot. And obviously the sculpture doesn't look anything like my paintings, but I I quite liked the this sort of image of the thorn being taken out of a foot. It's a very sort of mundane everyday image, but it's a sort of poignant symbol of at what point do we accept or reject suffering and pain. You know, where do we, if you if you run or walk with a thorn in your foot, you can go quite some time without taking it out. But at some point you decide that that's too much and you take it out. And it's that sort of dilemma, you know, what point in painting is too much or too little? And then in a way what I did is I took these drawings and I cut them up um, and then restructured these cut up drawings into a new set of drawings. So they were fragmented, um, sort of dispersed and scattered, if you like, and then made those drawings into, into this painting. So I made the sort of the thought that the boy with the thorn is foot, almost part of this, the strata of this, the sort of abstracted landscape, as if it was sort of, um, he became part of its fabric. And I think of it as a bit like, a, almost like a weaving, like a fabric, that painting is sort of woven together and I often think about painting as being something else rather than painting. I find that helps me to um, loosen the pressure of painting, if you like, to not worry about that, it, not worry that it's painting with all its grand history and all the pressures associated with that, but just to think, OK, it's, you know, I often think of painting as a sort of a rug that I'm weaving or a glass stained glass window that I'm putting together or a chair that I'm building. So I try to sort of make it much more straightforward by making it into something else. And I find that psychologically helps me to think about what it is I'm doing. Okay, next painting, please. Now this painting again on, this is on going back to the panel paintings is on gesso. And this is uh, 180 centimeters high by 150 centimeters wide. Uh, and it's called Still Movement. Ironically, I actually came across a lovely piece of text only a couple of weeks ago. This painting was made uh, about a year and a half ago now um, by uh, Ilya Prajin, who's a physicist, and Isabel Stenger, a chemist. And it goes like this. Each age searches for its own model of nature. For classical science, it was the clock. For 19th century science, the period of the Industrial Revolution, it was the engine running down. What will it be for us? Perhaps a junction between stillness and motion, time arrested and time passing. And that's um, something that I've often felt about in my sort of journeys in the landscape. This idea that when you move well, you move as if you are still. So there's that sense that if you can move through the landscape with a sense of stillness, you both accept what it is and it, it it almost gives you energy. And I think that's a sort of a positive and a a natural state to be in as a, as a human being. It's a natural state to be in in relationship to, to the natural world. So this sort of trying to find a sort of painterly equivalent for this in painting, you know, through line, through colour, through surface, through the layering of colour and line and surface has become really pivotal in what I do. I mean, I'd add to that also, um, I call them kind of codes in a way, but sort of patterns, if you like. The way, you know, human beings are sort of natural pattern makers. We like to see codes. We like to see the patterns in the world. And if you look at nature 
hard enough, you'll see those patterns clearly. If you look at the a leaf, you know, uh, the skeleton of a leaf on the floor, and you'll see the pattern of its construction, or the the skeleton of a, a, a small bird or a, a small mammal, you'll see the beautiful intricate patterning of the structure of the the, the bones, um, or whether that is the strata of um, the fracturing of of rocks in a cliff face. There's always the sense that there are structures holding everything together. There's, a, there's a, a beautiful code holding all these things together. So the relationship of kind of phenomena, as in the way ex you experience things that you can't necessarily control. So things like wind, heat, rain, and the way we understand sort of objects and topography you know, the, a mountain is is a is a is an object, is a is a piece of stuff in the world. But depending on your experience of the phenomena on the day that you climb that mountain, will change your experience of that stuff. And I think of painting in a way a bit like that. So that relationship between line as and and color as phenomena, and the coding of patterning of things as a sort of the way the world is, is something that you'll see coming up in the work. OK, next, next painting, please. OK, I just thought to to end the sort of part on my own work, I would go through some images of the work I've made for our support pledge. I'm going to talk about the pledge in, in more detail in, in a bit. But um, over the last year, because that has very much dominated my life, although I have also still carried on painting, um, I had to find a way of productively making work um, whilst maintaining our support pledge and also showing by example to the people using our support pledge how you might use it, how it works. So I decided just to work in sets of work throughout the year, uh, making um, small works on paper, uh, all mostly all in ink, um, on a handmade handmade paper that's actually made in the Himalayas. Um, it's a very beautiful handmade, quite a rough paper. And these two are part of the very first series I did, which was called In and Through. And the In and Through really is the way I think about the landscape. You don't look at landscape, you experience it in and through. You have to be both in it and pass through it. So that sort of stillness and movement to really understand what it is. So the one on the left is actually a sort of smaller mini project within the In and Through series called Bonescapes, um, where I was thinking about um, the, the element of dwelling in the landscape and that the origins of the word dwell, um, if I remember this correctly, has something to do with um, where our bones are scattered, where our bones lie. And that you know, our sense of dwelling, our sense of longing to dwell in a place is, is about where we where we um, die in a way. I mean, even our, even the word humanity comes from humando, which means to bury. So our sense of humanity, our sense of kindness is about the way we bury. And actually, I, I thought of these as a bit looking a little bit like X-rays, um, X-rays of bones, only they're, they're based on drawings I've got, I, I make of the landscape around uh, my home, the studio in East Sussex. OK, next next slide, please. OK, this is um, called these are part of the Gatescape series, which came next, which was looking at gates. Gates is um, really I, I kind of like the idea of gates is this sort of metaphor for how we think about human relationship to landscape. You know, a gate is kind of arbitrary. It's a decision to put a barrier between um, one part of the landscape and the next. And it's sort of modern man in a way, you know, the industrial man from the last 6,000 years that has decided that gates are a kind of good idea. Whereas, you know, societies that didn't try to control the landscape but lived in it, they didn't really use gates because they had no need for them. They occupied the nature because they were part of it. So I, in a way, sort of these gatescape paintings, I was thinking of a way of trying to transcend that barrier, try to move, as, as if the gate was becoming eroded by the natural environment and falling back into it. So I was trying to make the gates feel more like they were organic at the same time as been having a sort of sense of being man-made. Okay, the next next slide, please. 
And then this is part of the the, the last uh, latter series of work which I'm, I'm still working on called the Wayfinders. Uh, and Wayfinders uh, are a kind of from Polynesia, and they would they Wayfinders were able to navigate the oceans well before modern forms of navigation, you know, tens of thousands of years. And this has eluded, eluded modern cartographers for a long time. How did they do it? And one of the ways that wayfinders find to navigate the oceans is by not falling asleep. So what they do is they, the wayfinder has to stay awake on the whole voyage. By staying awake, they learn to read the story of the voyage. They learn to read the swell of the sea, the color of the star, um, the, the layout of the stars, the color of the clouds. A cloud over land makes is a different colour than a, la, a cloud over the sea. And by retelling the story of those swells and those colours and those juxtapositions of stars, they are able to return home. So I like that idea, that sense of being curious, being open and aware of the natural world, enables us to go home. OK, is there one more slide? I think there's one final slide on this. OK, yes, this is the, the final slide in, in the Wayfinder series. So this really, you know, the Wayfinder for me is a, is a very good metaphor for thinking about how I think about painting uh, and how I think about life. And it is the point really, I was thinking about these ideas just before I started our support pledge. And so our support pledge gave me the opportunity or the, having to make work through that period gave me the opportunity really to explore these ideas. Uh, and to, to to rethink how I thought about things like the edges of a painting and the surface of a painting and the space of a painting. So if you look at these two images, they could be uh, you know, purely abstract or they could be looking through some kind of net into the sky or some sort of structure that sort of ephemeral structure. Or they could also be kind of hallucinations, if you like. Um, and that, you know, that relationship of being of hallucinating without sleep, I've, I've, I've often wondered whether the Wayfinder could include hallucinations into their sleep, into their understanding, sorry, of returning home. So this is the end of the Wayfinder series. And I think what we're going to do now is before I move on to talking about art, art support pledge, is just to open up to just a few questions about my work, if there's anything or anything I've spoken about. Yes, uh, Matthew, can you hear me? I can't, yes. Perfect. Uh, so just you won't be able to see me, people, but um, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions that have come in now. So reminder, we're doing different parts of this talk uh, and we're asking questions intermediately. So I'm going to ask a first question from Wendy. Wendy is asking, is there any artists that have influenced your own work or you, you or do you use purely your own ideas? Oh, as many artists who influenced my work um, and they've changed massively over the over 20, 30 years of being an artist. Um, I was very influenced by sort of early Renaissance work when I started out because I, when I was, I think I was about 19, I did a tour uh, of Italy and went and saw all the sort of early Italian great Italian painters like Giotto and Piero della Francesca. And they've remained, I think Giotto and Piero della Francesca have remained two of my favorite artists. But um, over time that's changed. I mean, I've, uh, in contemporary artists, I really love the work of uh, Terry Winters and Bryce Marden, who were sort of the generation beyond the sort of American uh, abstract painters. And I mean, they're still around and working um, in New York. Um, but really, it's it's artists who I think have been able to find a way of engaging with painting and nature and the condition of where we find ourselves as, as a modern man, if you like, and, and or modern people. Uh, there's plenty of others. I, I would have a long list and I'm sure I'd forget most of them. Um, Agnes Martin has become someone who is, has been very influential on my thinking in the last three or four years. Um, and again, for the same sort of reasons, trying to make a painting about absence uh, and presence. I think she does that probably better than any other kind of modern painter. Any other questions? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So I've got another question. Uh, they haven't left their name, but um, your paintings appear 
really physically engaged yet carefully structured are you particularly aware of the duality when painting or is it more organic slash instinctive in nature mm, that's a really good question um I mean, it's it's both really. I I, I I try to create the conditions for being instinctive in what I do, but I think there's a, there's a sort of, in a way, when we always act instinctually, we might think we're acting on instinct, but actually very often we're acting on habit, but just not thinking about it. And so I think to be to really truly be instinctive about what you're doing. You have to be in a place that feels exciting and fresh and you and you have to be in a place where you have to call upon your strongest instincts, instincts to respond productively. So I in those circumstances, I often use, you know, I'm often quite strategic in how I place myself in those positions. So I'll strategize to a certain level, knowing that when I get to a certain point, I have to act on instinct. And then vice versa, sometimes, you know, my instinct will start to fail and I have to strategize my way out of it. So I never really think of it as one thing or another. I think of it as a sort of duality of movement between things. Um, and maybe that movement, I mean, movement between things really is, is, is a way I would often talk about making my work. You know, I, I try to create the scenarios for that to happen. You know, even if you look at the, you know, the images on the screen now, you know, there's a movement between a line and a dot and a circle and a rhythm of those things and sort of flowed areas of colour. And it's trying to find a coalescence between those things that both unifies them, but allows them to be but also distinctive. So I set up strategically that set of relationships, but then I have to be instinctive in how I resolve and, 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 and organically work with that. OK, is there any other any other questions? Yes, so I've got a question from Elaine. She's asking, how was the experience of lockdown with more walking and appreciation of our um, an appreciation of our environment influencing your work? So, I mean, I guess that's a massive thing, I guess, in terms of the amount of time we're spending walking or running within lockdown. Has, has that sort of been in, 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 in changed your work or in any way? Um, well, my experience of lockdown has probably been very different than everybody else's. Uh, I haven't had as much free time as I would usually have, so I've actually done less of that than everybody else. Um, I still do it and I, I'm pretty disciplined about making sure I get out and run every day. Um, but certainly I've not been able to do what I would usually do. I mean, I, I do, you know, it's not unusual that I'd run 40, 50 miles at the weekend. Um, so that's a long time been out in the landscape. I mean, I do that every week, but, um, you know, I spend a lot of time in the landscape. Um, and I've all I've done that for a long, long time, you know, for many, many years now. I think the thing that I think has been really interesting is less what I'm the changes it's made to my life, because that really I've always done that is that I think other people have understood the benefits of spending time in nature. And I, I'm, I hope that going forward, that will not only affect the, the, you know, the quality of people's lives, but also the way we think about the world around us and, uh, you know, the art we look at and what the role of art is. You know, I think often we think of art as somehow separate from nature. You know, it's culture and nature and they're two separate entities that don't correlate. And I, I think that's been a mistake actually in, in, in the modern period. Um, actually, you know, developing really over the last few thousand years that somehow the culture of mankind is in opposition to nature. I think it's really about how we understand nature. Now, it's about a relationship to nature. And if we do that well, we'll have a good relationship to it. And to ourselves, you know, not only to nature in terms of what we see outside, but also to our own nature individually, but also communally as a community. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I'm just aware that obviously we'd, we've been talking about your painting now, and now uh, you're going to talk about the pledges that you've done and the artist support pledge and you're going to also talk about the initiatives that you've run so bearing that in mind I have got a couple of other questions but um, and thank you for the guests that sent those in 
but I think it might be best to ask those after because one of them is based around what the most important things that an art school can do now and one of them is based around thinking about the wider skills and attributes that creatives need to develop so I think would you prefer if I just ask those after your next section? I think you're muted sorry. Yeah uh, I think they'd go quite well at the end actually yeah. in the final okay. section. So for the people that have asked those questions I think what I'll do is I'll save those for the end. Um, Matthew's going to now talk about the next section and for everyone else that's now listening could you please just keep those questions coming in because we will have we will have plenty of time throughout this talk to um, answer those questions um, and this is just the first section. Okay thank you over to you Matthew this is great Thanks, well, I'm really enjoying this. Thank you. Okay so I'm going to do kind of the whistle stop tour of our support pledge how it started um, how it works um, how to do it and, and obviously you can ask questions at the end if there's anything that comes up. So on the 16th of March last year it's just over a year ago I was sitting at my computer answering emails and cancelling events exhibitions and seeing messages coming in from friends and colleagues who were doing the same and it felt like there was a tsunami of desperation flooded across the art world artists not only artists i knew in the south of england but across the world were losing their lifestyles and their incomes overnight and most artists don't have um, jobs that they could then be supported by in that period you know they work in gig economies or they work from the sales of their work and if they stopped they would have no income so it felt like there was this very desperate sudden desperate situation so in response to that I set up our support pledge and this is actually an image of the very very first post on the evening of the 16th of March uh, 2020 and it's it's it was my sort of profession to the world of how it worked and you can see the text on the right where I said I will post this work for sale uh, so it was a, an etching which was prophetically called the seer but that was just what I had lying around the studio um, for sale for 200 pounds and I pledged that when I reached a thousand pounds worth of sales I would buy another artist's work who used the hashtag for 200 pounds I put this on in the evening and the following day I sold a thousand pounds worth of these prints and I was able to make the first pledge and buy another artist's work at that point I think there was only two other people who had actually joined the hashtag but I knew it was gaining momentum because I was getting you know thousands of messages I mean by the end of the first day second day sorry I was getting more than two messages a second and it went on like that for months so the momentum was gaining very rapidly um, so can I have the next slide please Thanks, Jeffrey. So on the second day, uh, I'd gone to the studio and was still painting, but my phone was starting to go a bit crazy. And I decided that, well, I meant, what if I just tried a bit harder? I've already managed to make the pledge and buy another artist's work. If I tried a bit harder, how many other people could do that? So I came up with the, the art support pledge red tile, which you can see on the left. This is actually the new one. It's, it's not the one I came up with originally and a text panel which you can see on the right which is just a very simple set of instructions about what our support pledge is and how it works that's been adapted significantly over the last year because now it includes um, yen and canadian dollars australian dollars and american dollars um, because we needed to sort of you know to keep it simple but we also needed to kind of make it fair because it went global quite quickly and the principle was quite simple you've posted your work on Instagram on your account you join all those up together with everybody else by using the hashtag hashtag art support pledge you can see it on the screen that joins automatically on Instagram all these people together in one place so a buyer can just go onto the hashtag look for work they like message the artist and buy their work so it was a really very simple light touch way of connecting artists to buyers but also what was interesting is it enabled artists to become patrons too because
because that when they met the thousand pound threshold they were able to buy another artist's work okay next slide please so when you go on to if you put if you search for hashtag art support pledge you'll see this on the left where you can see the blue line i've put around you'll see that that's what you follow the one above it with the red tile our support pledge that's the art support pledge instagram account and the instagram account has on it information about how it works uh, different sorts of events initiatives it's doing um, so it's almost like a kind of uh, but it's not only an information center but more like a magazine for our support pledge it keeps people informed and also um, we run uh, events from that including prizes uh, so we have the art services award we have the tyson awards um, we also have uh, various other kind of um, selective events where we invite people to curate exhibitions on the account itself. So what you do is you you follow the, the both of those accounts, but the hashtag is where if you click on that, you'll see what you can see on the right. What you see on the right is what the hashtag looks like. I mean, this is just a random photograph taken, screenshot taken of it, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago. Uh, at this point, there's 560,000 posts and you can just scroll down through those posts and click on one you like and then message the artist. Or if you post your own work, it'll come up on this um, rolling um, page. Now, this is always moving. So one of the things that I often get comments about is people will post a work and they'll say, oh, it's disappeared. It was there for a few minutes and it's gone. It hasn't disappeared it's just moved uh, you know the account as people load more images it moves down the image list so with any instagram inter intervention really you have a, really about a 24-hour window when the work is really viable to be sold it's always available but in that first 20 hours not only is the work more visible because it's it's within the uh the rolling screen but also Instagram automatically pushes it to more people. Once after 12 hours, that starts to slow down. After 24 hours, it, it decreases massively. And you'll probably notice that if you use Instagram, you get a lot of likes in the first 12 hours, then it starts to slow down. And then by 24 hours, you're lucky to get one or two extra. You will get them, but you won't get so many. So it's a dynamic platform. You have to use it or you lose it. You don't, it's not it's not like a shop window. You don't put it in the shop window and walk away and forget about it. You post and then you post again. And one of the ways of doing this is to, if you've posted work and it hasn't sold in a couple of days, it's and you want to repost it, it's just to delete it and repost it. And that will push it back up the hashtag uh, or post it and then delete it. It's probably the best way of doing it. So that enables you to keep the work being seen by more people and different people will see it each time. So it's a way of doing that. Also, you'll notice at the top of those images, it says either top or recent. If you're not aware of how Instagram works, top means the top posts. They're the posts who, that are getting seen the most. At our support pledge, we recommend that you click on recent because recent um, shows you chronologically what's posted. So that just shows you what comes up, uh, which is a much fairer way of doing things. OK, next slide, please. So um, once we went it gone live and it was you know spreading around the world, uh, I think by two weeks it was co almost completely global. We had it in every continent other than Antarctica. Uh, and I was getting uh, a lot of um, support from other institutions who were coming forward to say, you know we can help you. And this is actually an advert in Freeze magazine, and they gave me the advert for free where um, we used what was my very early, my first strap line I used for our support pledge, I think on the first or second day, which is generosity is infectious. Now, this is a, a sort of way of approaching the world, which I've used quite a few times over the years, where I take things that are bad things that are happening in the world and I turn them around. So I make bad things into good things. And I often think making paintings is a bit like that. So I, I, I quite like that kind of play on doing things. So. I set up um, a series of um, artist mentoring schemes over the last 15 years. And to do that, I use the, 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 the principles of sort of terrorist cells. So rather than a terrorist cell, 
which is used to create and establish sort of violence, if you like, and hate in the world. I took the idea of what if you took little cells and groups of artists and got them to do things that were good, got them to support one another and to, in, in every way, both intellectually, critically, uh, emotionally, and also in their careers, and spread these cells out around the art world and use these cells to do good things. And it was using these this network of artists, which comes from a, a project I called Artist um, ABC, ABC Projects originally, and then it eventually turned into Artist Support Projects, and hence then Artist Support Pledge. So I did the same with Artist Support Pledge. I took the idea that we had a virus, and this virus was spreading rapidly. And I thought, well, actually, a virus spreading rapidly is an effective way of a disease carrying itself. What if it's also an effective way of supporting one another? What if we make create a kind of <coughs> cultural infection, if you like? So I use this idea of generosity. Now, generosity is, I didn't just randomly come up with this. It's been something that I've worked with for quite some years. So if we can see the next slide, please. Generosity is a, a concept of thinking about culture, which I think is a really productive way of doing anything. And basically, I take generosity to mean, as a definition, giving more than is usual and expected and being free from meanness and smallness of character. So in other words, doing a little bit extra and not judging others, but actually being open to the possibilities of what they think and what they believe. And what I found over kind of years of researching this is not only did it work in many cultures, and even interestingly, um, there was a um, athletics coach in America in the 1980s, and sadly I've forgotten his name, uh, who was one of the most successful athletics coaches in American Olympic history, who realized that actually cultures who prospered in generosity also created very good athletes. So he actually got his athletics, American athletics team, to work within the community. And that athletics team became the most successful athletics team in American history. So this idea that generosity has a knock on effect to the way we perform and everything we do in life. And I started to look into um, kind of pre-industrial societies. This is quite some time ago now, but it's been something that's fascinated me. And in hunter-gatherer societies, generosity is one of the founding principles of the society. It's one of the things that it's one of their highest ethical values. And stinginess is seen as a really bad thing. And they have a principle in hunter-gatherer societies, which is something I based our support pledge on. And it's about the division of assets and the division of meat. So when they go out to hunt uh, as a group, as a village, the person who gets the kill, the person whose arrow kills the uh, the animal, doesn't get to keep the meat. Instead, they get the honour of dividing the meat amongst family and friends and neighbours. And then they get the honour of dividing that meat again amongst family, friends and neighbours. And so the asset of that kill, the meat, gets spread across the whole community. So everyone gets fed. So this is a way of kind of thinking about a division of assets that's inspired me to come up with the notion of the pledge that when you reach a certain point your role was not just to walk away with the money but to support your friend and your colleagues and they in, their, in turn do the same so it becomes a sort of horizontal economy money travels not upwards to a, a minority of people at the top but sideways those people have to support others and everyone is supporting others by 20 percent so this division division of assets became central to the way our support pledge worked Okay, next slide, please. So there was a number of um, problems that happened at the beginning of our support pledge with using Instagram that I realized that Instagram favors popularity and most social media is set up to do, um, to kind of favor the, if you like, our bias for what we want and what we desire. And it decides that what we want and what we desire is popular people. But obviously that's not a very fair way of spreading an economy fairly across across uh, its network. And this image which you can see of uh, the campfire was another hunter-gatherer principle which I really liked. 
which is this idea that if you find yourself in the community without food, if the, the food hasn't been divided to reach you, all you have to do is to is to go to another campfire, another family, and they are obliged to care for you and look after you. It's this idea that how can we, how could I find a way to make um, the community of our support pledge support one another, not just financially, but also in kind. And I had a, a really great few days working with MIT Media Lab in the US, and they're one of the top tech research labs in the world. And we were looking at kind of tech ways. Could we create a, a tech platform that implicitly embedded generosity into its technology? And there are, yes, there are ways of doing that. We did come up with some solutions. But in the end, I, what I needed was something that worked straight away, that would work tomorrow. And one of the guys there came up with a really clever solution, and that was actually to ask people to do it. So I came up with the in-view tile, and the in-view tile you can see here. And on an in-view tile, what you do is you post the red in-view tile, and then up to seven artists on the same post on the artist support pledge that you look at, or you admire, or you're interested in. So what that does is it brings people to your campfire, if you like. If a buyer comes to your account, they look at what you're looking at. So it spreads the generosity across your network. So what the InView tile does in a way is it joins people up. It connects one community to another community, to another community across the whole network of our support pledge. It's quite a challenge to get people to do it, I have to say, but it really works. And it, it has a double effect because not only does it is it a generous act because you're inviting other people to your table, but actually the algorithms of Instagram favor that kind of generosity. They favor users who connect with other users. So it benefits you as well as it benefits others. So it was a really neat and sort of simple way of culturally changing the way the algorithms of uh, Instagram operate. Okay, next slide, please. So when, um, you know, when you look at the hashtag itself, you'll notice that everyone's on it. You know, I don't discriminate. Anyone is allowed on it. Students, amateurs, uh, professionals. I, I decided very early on that it, it shouldn't be an edited and curated uh, platform. It should be like nature, wild. It should be a broad ecosystem where all artists are allowed to participate. And not only artists, but makers. Um, so, you know, you'll get people making dresses and people making jewellery and people making furniture and ceramics. I didn't want to create division. I wanted to create a sense of mutual support across all those sectors. But I also needed to be able to show supporters and buyers what might be available on there, because it can be a little overwhelming if the first thing you do is click on the hashtag and you see hundreds of thousands of images. So I created little into. Uh, interventions into this on the Art Support Pledge Instagram account under the title of XLX. And on XLX, what I do is I invite art world professionals from gallery directors to critics to um, art book publishers. So Andrew Brown um, is an art book publisher. We've had directors of First Sight. We've had critics from Paul Kerry Kent to uh, Louisa Book. Uh, I get them to select um, seven artists. So it's one a day for a week and um, uh, to write a little bit of text about the artist. And then we post, I post those on the Art Support Pledge account and also on the Art Support Pledge website. And that um, is a very effective way of drawing attention to those artists, but it shows the breadth and variety of artists on the account. And also for me, importantly, it stops it being just something that is about me. Because, you know, this is a lot of this has been centered around my activities. I think it's really important that it's it shows a breadth of what's going on. Breadth and depth are, are two things that really matter to me. That the art world's ecosystem is broad. It shows everybody from the smallest to the largest, and that it also allows for the depth, depth of insight into what that is. And so XLX really was about showing what that is. And then uh, the slide on the, sorry, the image, the red tile on the right is called Insights, which actually is, I've recently changed the name to Know How because it was getting a bit confusing with uh, Insights. It's already on Instagram. But Insights or Know How, as it's now called, 
is really a way for users of our support flows to spread and share knowledge and wisdom of their experiences of being an artist and using our support pledge. It can be anything from how they mix paint to how they go about um, selling work on our support pledge or photographing the work to sell it, anything. Anything that can help support and inform their peers and friends on our support pledge. OK, next slide, please. Um, very early on on our support pledge, I decided I sort of needed a set of rules as to how it worked and what I, how I should behave because it was a, a movement. It's, it's not um, it's not an organisation with a central body, if you like, that controls everything. It's a movement and movements need a sort of set of ethics to live by. And I certainly needed a set of ethics to run it by because I needed to know what was the best decision to make each day. So I came up with a set of rules and these are the rules which I think are a good place to start anything. Starts with you. In other words, we all all equally responsible and every um, circular economy needs full involvement. Unlike sort of top down economies where you have people in charge and then people under them. In circular economies and mutually supportive economies, everybody has to be responsible and everybody has to support one another. So it all starts with you. Not just me, but you too. <laughs> it welcomes all, so there's to be no discrimination. It gives more than is expected or usual, so each one of us just has to work that little bit harder to help and support one another. You don't have to work massively hard, you don't have to do what I've done, you just need to do that little bit extra. All those little bit extras make a massive difference. It creates opportunities for all, so it spends its time not only creating opportunities for itself and for yourself, but for your friends and your peers. It respects and nurtures breadth and depth of experience and knowledge. So it understands that both breadth and depth are important in, in being a more viable cultural ecosystem. And in that, that must include both our knowledge and our experience. Some will have more or less than others, but all of that together combined is important. It uses networks to support others. So you use, I use my personal network to set up our support pledge and to keep my support pledge going, and I'm still doing that. And I ask others to do the same. If we all do that, it all works. It uses success to support others. So each one of us who has success, whatever we do, whether it's on our, our, our support pledge or in our life generally, it's the greatest honor of that success is not in being distinct from everybody else, but in having the honour of supporting others. And that's a, a total complete shift in value systems from our usual kind of capitalist um, market system, which values exclusivity and power. I'm saying that actually the greatest success is not exclusivity and power, but the honour of support. It has an open membership. In other words, anyone can join. There is, There are no... Um, regulations to that joining and yes that means that some people might abuse it but that's the nature of community and we have to accept that it respects all ecosystems and ethnologies so it has to find a way of living productively with nature and those who live within it and they are the nine rules of our support pledge and i've tried to live by them and continue to live by them and continue to um to keep those as a motivating factor moving forward. Okay, I think there's one more slide on this. That's the next slide, Jeffrey. Okay, no, that's it. Okay, if we move back to the next slide, please. Excellent. Right, well, if you have any uh, questions on our support pledge, now is the, is the time to ask. Are you there, Matt? Yes. Yeah, so thank you for that. That was really good. So if you've got artist support pledge questions, please keep them coming in. I've just got a couple of questions uh, based on your sort of influences in the meantime. Uh, so someone that actually asked, are you interested in any specific spiritual notions or practices that inform your work and lifestyle? So I think you touched upon this already, but um, do you want to just look at look at that again? 
Yeah, and, and um, certainly. Um, lots. <laughs> I, you know, I was brought up in a, in a quite a religious family, and I, I guess it's quite hard to sort of um, move away from that when it's been, you know, such a part of your life. You know, my my, my parents were, were both artists, and you know, and it was a kind of religious upbringing. And within that, I I really got a, a strong sense that community mattered, and that uh, a, a kind of sense of a kind of spiritual life. But obviously, you know, like anybody, I, I had to find my own way in life and find my own sense of what that means. Um, and so now, really, I think of, you know, I, I try not to define things when it comes to things like spiritual entities. I'm interested in everything and everybody. I think if that's my rule of life, uh, that's what I, that's that's what I believe. And I, I look at all sorts of different spiritual practices. I practice some, um, but I'm interested and curious about them all. I think they they add to the rich tapestry of who we are as a human species. Excellent, thank you. So it's interesting, I haven't got any artist support pledge related questions yet. Uh, I thought those would be the ones that would come flooding in. So please, if you have any artist support pledge related questions, keep those coming in. I do have another question from before. So it is basically along the lines of, I think every artist knows the point during the process where one gets afraid to mess the current work up, but at the same time knows that it is not fully finished yet. How do you deal slash overcome this fear? So, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, um, I mean, sometimes people just say you just got to do it, and that's true. But actually, I think there are there are smarter ways of dealing with it. And one of the smart ways I've worked out is that is don't get to the point where you fear about ruining it. And that normally that comes because you spent too long looking at it and too long making judgments and decisions about it. So one of the things I do is I have multiple projects on the go at the same time throughout every day. So I work on works on paper, large scale paintings, small paintings, very mundane stuff like just sizing and priming up um, canvases. And I every morning I write a list of tasks to do that day. Um, and I do them one, I do them and I spend hard. I don't ever spend more than sort of 30 minutes on one thing at a time. So if I'm working on a large painting, I might spend I might spend 40 minutes, but that's rare. 30, 40 minutes on that and then I move on and I spend five, 10, 15 minutes working on a drawing, then I move on, then I spend, I might spend half an hour just priming up a canvas, then I move on, I might go back to making the painting again, and then I might go on to making some small paintings. By constantly moving around the room and moving around the, the um, studio and the work that I'm making, I never get to that point where I think, oh, is that any good? It's just a task being fulfilled. And actually I find, and that might sound a bit, contrary in a way, but I find I make much better work than I do that. In the end, the work is better. And really, that's what matters. It doesn't matter what I think. It matters that the work's good. And that just I find a very effective way of making work. I mean, obviously, I, I have a, a quite a large studio, so um, it's very easy for me in a way to do that. But you can do it in sort of smaller ways. So even things like, you know, now because I do our support pledge as well, I might spend 20 minutes um, doing some emails or writing a post or writing an interview or doing an interview, you know, a live interview or something on with the press. And then I'll move on from that and I might spend a bit of time drawing. Um, and then I, I also, you know, break the day up but doing other things. So going for a run, I find helps to reestablish my thought processes or even just walking the dog or going out drawing, you know, walking for 20 minutes with a sketchbook and just drawing stuff. It sort of puts off that moment where you start thinking, I'm worried. I fear that work. Fearing your work is something to be avoided, I think. OK, I've got some artist pledge, uh, artist support pledge questions that have come through now. Um, so this is a great one. This is a corker. Um, I don't have a website. Can I still join the artist support pledge? Uh, you don't need a website. You just need uh, a, an Instagram account on social media. So um, to be honest, our support pledges are movements and theoretically it could work absolutely anywhere. And in November, we will be doing our first museum show uh, and hopefully more like it. But it's currently centered on Instagram because Instagram 
is a very effective way of making it work. Most, a lot of artists use it, uh, and it's 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 still probably the best social media platform for images. Um, so, you know, it's it's that's why it's central to Instagram. But you don't need a website, just a phone. Thank you. Yeah, just the phone, exactly. Um, so another question I've got related to the artist support pledge, and this is actually something we spoke about on Artcast on Morley Radio. Um, as a great initiative, can you see this project becoming a permanent feature of the art world? Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as I understand it now, it will be. Uh, it, I am working towards um, making it permanent. I mean, it, it is in a sense already permanent. I can't get rid of it. It's just about maintaining the health of it. And any movement is only as good as the health of it. You know, a movement can turn bad if it's not nurtured, not looked after. So I am currently working with a number of different partners to to make it a more permanent fixture. Um, I'm about to take on um, administrative support and commission um, researchers and all the rest of it to help us to get us through the next year um, to make to establish a kind of the organisation as a more viable um, entity to maintain and nurture that movement. Excellent, thank you. So just looking through some more questions related to the artist support pledge. The pledge restored faith, my faith in humanity and in the artist community and really felt like it spoke to artists. Do you think it helped the success of the pledge as it connected with the ethical slash political leaning of artists rather than being focused on the monetary gains. Absolutely. I mean, to me, that's the most, you know, it's not the most important thing. They're all linked. And I think the thing is to remember is the economy of our support pledge works in a generous culture. If you strip away that generous culture, those acts of kindness and that sense that it's, we're all in this together, it doesn't work. The economy breaks down. So, you know, that's one of the things that's very hard to to get, you know, people to understand that if we want to thrive, then we all must thrive. It's no good one of us doing really well if if all of us aren't doing very well. So it's it's a shift in cultural values, complete shift in cultural values. But I mean, since I've done this, I've realized that I, you know, I'm not the only one who's been thinking like this and um, in propagating these sort of values and ideas for some time it's that i think the time is right you know the time is now that we reject this idea that somehow human nature is about greed and human nature is about um, superiority and power i mean that's got us to a world which has been killed at a rate of knots we can't control and to a highly socially unequal society and I just I just don't think that's a good way to go. I think it's it, it so worries me that we've accepted that as if that's normal. But if you look at anthropology and look at sort of pre-industrial societies, they didn't operate that way. So it isn't actually human nature. It's the nature of our culture. And that nature can be changed quite quickly. We've just got to change how we behave and how we think. So it's you know, it's in a way, you know, that might take time sometimes, but I think our support pledge has showed that all you've got to do is shift the value system very slightly and it changes the way we behave and it changes the way we support one another. And I think artists were, re were uh, are kind of great, uh, sort of a, a fertile ground for doing this really, because artists, I think, naturally understand that sense of giftedness and in that, understand that sense of mutual support. They, most artists operate in communities like that where they have to support one another. Um, and the sense that art has very often in, in human history been part of gifted economies rather than um, sort of capitalist economies. And I've often felt that art's never very sat, it hasn't ever ve sat very well in a culture of power. It's always been uncomfortable in it. You know, that's why we were always sort of agitated by it. And in a way, I think you know, our support pledge took off not just for people who were at the bottom of the social, at the social and economic spectrum, but even for people at the top because they saw the need for it. 
they saw the need for a shift in values. Um, so yes, absolutely, I think it's been pivotal to it. Thank you. Got quite a few questions coming in, and it's proving to be quite a popular topic, and <laughs> absolutely understandably why, um, because it has obviously we, we spoke about this together in the podcast, but it's obviously become such a um, sort of saving grace for a lot of artists that were left without work at the start of the pandemic and a way of artists, as you say, being generous to each other and, and, and supporting each other and, and, and being able to make a sustainable model. So the next question I've got, do you consider that this horizontal approach as opposed to the vertical or pyramid schemes of spreading financial income through generosity and awareness can be considered a form of teaching towards an utopian Anthropocene? And if so, how can this message get across beyond the community of artists into the wider public? Now that's a that's a really interesting question actually. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, that is the question really. That I, I get asked this every day. <laughs> um, and it's, it's complicated because the, the general principles of our support pledge hold fast across all systems. In other words, you know, cultures of generosity, mutual support. The, 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 the challenge really at the moment, I think, is in finding ways to make it work within different types of industries. Um, but I think as a general principle that we put support of others as the greatest honour of our society will create a different looking world than we have at the moment. And, you know, there's so much about the way we live right now, the way we, the, the language we use, you know, the language of politics, the language of growth and progress, the language of power and control, the way we put those things on a pedestal as if they are the most important things there are. And yet they create an awful lot of damage. So a sensible and honest, not a reactionary debate, but an honest debate about actually what sort of values do we want to live by and what sort of world do we want to live in? And I actually think that most people would rather live in a world where everyone is fed and everyone can thrive rather than a world where we aspire to be super wealthy, super rich and super famous. I just, I just don't see, you know, I know we're sold that dream, but I just, it's not a dream I want and I don't think it's a dream we should aspire to. Excellent, thank you. So as artists, we're often thinking about how socially engaged our work is. Did this make you question broader issues about art and artists as a society, almost as a form of institutional critique? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a slightly unusual take on this because I think art by nature is changes the way we think and feel and behave and value the world. So it's political. I don't think you need to make art that's political for it to be, you can make art that's political, I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I think the nature of art is that it's political because it changes the way we think. And the way we think manifests the way we live and the way we live is a political act. So I think really the, the big, the big failure, I think of, of the modern project, and I mean modern as in you know, the last few thousand years, not the last few hundred, but sort of developed industrial economies is that we've, we've taken everything apart and we've left it in pieces. So we, we think of art as being over here and science has been over there and, you know, politics and philosophy over there, uh, you know, and somewhere else. But actually, they're all about the same thing, they're all about how we live. And they're all different ways of looking about at how we live. And they're all important in how we live. And I think really what art has the capacity to do is to enable us to create an imagination that can put those things back together again and pro productively put them back together that allows us to live a more socially and environmentally um, responsible in, in responsible ways. Uh, and I, I think that's the great challenge. And it might take some time. I mean, it took, you know, 4,000 years for agro-industrial society to develop. So, you know, I, I'm not naive. I don't think we're going to suddenly change these things overnight. But I think as people, we can make decisions that can make small changes, like our support pledges made, you know, I know it might look like a big change, but in, in global terms, 
you know, it's small, it's still small, but it's proven that actually you can make big changes just with a decision. You know, I didn't have massive investment to do this. It was just making a decision, deciding to do things differently. And I think that should empower all of us to think, OK, I can make a difference. Thank you. So I've got a question from Wendy. It's a question about logistics with the artist support pledge. Mm -hmm. She talks about being dyslexic. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm dyslexic as well. And um, that obviously gives us a lot of superpowers, Wendy, as well. Um, but she's questioning the logistics in terms of sales. Um, she's talking about how she worries about things like PayPal and maybe any tips you would give to basically making a transaction once you have made a sale on artist support pledge. Yeah, um, it's a good question that actually what I advise, I actually do this because I find writing uh, quite complicated as well. It's not easy for me. Um, I have to have everything triple, quadruple checked. So what I do is I, I have sort of formats which I've already written out. So I have a format for making a post. All I all I do is change the title on it, the work. Um, most of the work's the same size, so I don't even have to change the size. So it's very simple. And I also have a set of a number of um, different responses to questions from people, which I can then cut and paste straight onto the messaging. I use PayPal. And I found um, as long as you use it, you know, correctly, uh, it's it's been really secure and very easy. But I also um, have direct payments into my bank account, and it, it's it's pretty it's it's you know I've, I've looked into this, and we've not you know unless you you shouldn't give out certain details, so you know never give out any access codes to your PayPal account if anybody asks. Um, you or the only thing you do is you just give your email. That's it. Um, and then they can pay straight into your PayPal account. So, you know, there are, it, it's fairly straightforward. It's quite foolproof. Um, I'm sure there, there will be people trying to scam people, I'm sure. I have come across a couple. But normally, if you're sensible, you can work it out. And if you're in doubt, get somebody else to have a look at it. Because sometimes, you know, if you're tired or you're in a hurry, you can make a rash decision to, you know, say something to somebody or respond to a question. I always find the best thing to do is just to sort of sit on it for a little bit and just say, OK, is, how do I respond to that? Or ask um, you know, somebody else to kind of have an opinion. Thank you. And another logistical question. Do you have to make a large amount of work in order to make the five to make your pledge? Or can you sort of just go along with that? It doesn't matter. You know, just get on it. I mean, one of one of the mottos I have, is, I have is start then get better. Um, you know, you don't. When I start, if you go, if you actually had a look on my own Instagram account, Matthew Burrows Studio, sorry, Matthew Burrows Studio. If you go back a year and look at the very first, you know, couple of months, even even more than that, I was all over the place. You know, I, I I didn't really know what I was doing. I was making it up as I went along. I was trying to figure out how this thing worked and. I was really super busy at the time, so I didn't even have time to photograph the work properly and stuff like that. But I've got better at it. I've built systems around myself for getting better at it. And actually, I quite enjoyed getting better at it. I think that's part of it. You know, learning to do something well is a joy. It's one of life's great joys. So don't fear it's got to be perfect. Just get on it, post the work and learn from others. I think one of the best tips I'd have is watch who's doing well and learn from them. Why are they doing well? What are they doing that's different? And nearly, I would almost guarantee, I mean, I've been following a number of people over the last year who've done well on it. And they, the one thing they all have in common is not only do they follow the guidelines, but they all do something slightly different. They all add their little, their, their own sort of flavor to it, whether that be that they, uh, you know, they do a very beautiful, photograph of the work in a, in a very nice context or they write a nice little bit of text to go with it or I mean one of the things I do on my account is I've added a little uh, bit of text about about myself who I am what I do so it's a little bio if you like which I just put on each post um, I don't write it each time I just cut and paste it on uh, and that's I think useful for buyers because it gives them a sort of sense of who you are so it's just being you know thoughtful and playful with it and having a go really 
Thank you. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple more questions based on the Artist Support Pledge and then we'll move on. So we've got one question. How do galleries feel about the Artist Support Pledge uh, from your experience? Um, so far, I've had pretty much a very positive experience with the industry. Um, I've, I've had a couple of galleries who have been um, unhappy about it. And there are quite a few galleries who uh, have requested their artists don't use it, uh, which I think is shameful, really, because not only are they telling their artists who might need to use it to not make a living, but also they're, they're not allowing their artists to help support others, which I think is really significant. To be honest, I, that's not as common as you'd think. And most galleries I've spoken to have understood the benefit of it that it's, it's not taking away from the mainstream market because it's created an economy for work that generally never gets seen in, in mainstream galleries because it's too small. And because it's too small, it's too cheap. And it's too cheap, they don't make a profit. So it costs quite a lot of money for a gallery to put a piece of work on their wall to administer that and to administer the sale of it. And they have to make a profit on top of that, minus the 50% that goes to the artist. So you'll tend to find that in galleries, you don't see very much below about three or four thousand pounds. Now, the reason for that is that's where the profit margin is for the for the gallery to, to make enough money to bother putting it on their wall. So, you know, charging 200 pounds, that's why it's this cheap, because it's a market for work that never gets seen normally. So it doesn't really compete with the galleries at all, really. Excellent, thanks. And there's one more question from Rob. Um, and I think to touch upon this, I think one of the things that we were talking about a couple of days ago when we, we were chatting, I think we were talking about how this whole situation of lockdowns is, is going to absolutely foster a, a boost in creativity, uh, as you were saying. And the, the question he was that Rob is, is asking is, uh, what advice could you give to an artist who wants to be a full time artist but cannot see how to achieve this whilst supporting themselves. Yeah, well, get on our support pledge is the first thing I'd advise um, because I know a lot of people who are supporting themselves. Uh, I mean, a, a lot, not just a few. I mean, not everybody, because obviously, you know, sadly, the reality of the world is not always absolutely perfect. Um, but a lot of people have managed to find a way of um, supporting themselves through using the pledge. I think. The other thing as well is, is be be true to yourself. I know everyone says this, but it really does matter. And it, in the end, it pays off. You've just got to kind of really do what you think you believe in and find the best way of doing that. And I guess follow your joy. Do the things that give you joy. If they're not giving you joy, don't do them. Find a way to give yourself joy. And no, so for me, you know, I realised over the years, I quite like doing oddball things like the pledge. You know, I'm an artist. I I love spending time in my studio and making my work. But I found that I'm much happier as an artist when I'm helping to support other artists. So I do the, a lot of the stuff I do. I don't get paid for. You know, I've, I don't get paid for doing our support pledge. Um, I just enjoy doing them. So and it's benefited me in the long run. I get paid because it's it's made my career but it's not you know i haven't looked for direct payment from the projects i've done i thought this is a project's interesting do it and actually the long-term effect of that has meant that i i make a living so it's one of those you know chicken and egg things sometimes you have to kind of take a punt on something but also this probably very neatly takes us into the next section which is much shorter so don't worry if you're falling asleep um which is really about I guess the main piece of advice I would give to starting out as a, or when I'm starting out, being an artist. So should we move on to that, Matt? Yeah, yeah. I think we'll move on now. So yeah. thank you to everyone that's asked questions. We'll move on to the next section now. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, Ravi. This is, this is great. We're really getting some insights into, into the Art Support Pledge, um, which has been an absolute 
uh, revolutionary sort of way to changing the, the gatekeepers to, to the art world. Uh, not, not necessarily revolutionary, but something that can sit alongside. So I think a lot of people that might have been thinking about starting out as being artists, it's basically a format where you can sell work for a lower price point, but then also support other artists. So it's very much creating that economy whereby we can all support each other rather than, but, but alongside the art world. It's not necessarily an alternative. It's something that can sit alongside the art world and it's really great. Thank you, Matthew. I'm going to head o uh, hand over to you now. Thank you. OK, so in a way, this is sort of the wrong way around, but it's uh, I thought it was a good place to end. Um, our support pledge came out of um, something called our support projects. And our support projects was a response to a position that a lot of artists find themselves in at various points in their lives, and especially perhaps, you know, five years out of education where they feel a little bit isolated and lonely and they don't really know how to move on with their careers and lives. And there isn't a sort of alternative um, route for how to, to do that. If you're not in a gallery or if you're not within an institution, how do you do that? So about 15 years ago, I started experimenting with different ideas for how, how I might come up with an idea for doing this. And 12 years ago now, um, I set up something that was originally called ABC Projects. And it was an opportunity really for artists to meet up in small groups of three or four, normally for sort of two days at a time, and to take uh, one another through a kind of process of support, which I developed through our support projects. There's, this is multifaceted. There's a number of different uh, ways of doing this. And I'm going to take you through just one element of this. Um, partly as a bit of fun to end on, but also as something that might be something you want to try a little later on and take away with you. So our support project projects, as I've uh, already said was a, a creative community founded on a culture of trust and generosity, supporting creative growth and opportunities for artists. And by doing this, I realised that actually there are a number of key things that artists often struggled with. And one of them was what their values were. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. And I, I spent some time exploring this, a number of years um, doing research on it and um, sort of trying to figure out why it was that artists who seemed to struggle with their values had the hardest time um, developing their careers. If they didn't know really what values they lived and worked by, it's very difficult to make decisions in life. And so I then you know, we, I discussed this with other artists for many years and then it was only over time I started to realise there were processes for working this out, which actually were very simple, work quite well. So I'm going to take you through one of these uh, processes tonight and you can perhaps try this out. OK, so how to work out what your life and work values are. Now, normally what uh, psychologists recommend in this is that you try and get them down to about three three values or three work values and three life values not quite sure why three works but it does seem to work quite well so what you do is if you can if you can um i'll take you through how it works and then i'll then i'll this sorry how what's written here then i'll take you through how it works so you take a list and tick values you think are priority in life i'll share that list in a minute so don't worry Next, you prioritize the values ticked with a number one, uh, ticked with a number from one to three. Then you write all the number ones down a piece of paper, compare and contrast each one. Try to work out which is a priority and which one serves that priority. E.g., you may have creativity and effectiveness, but realize that you use creativity to be more effective and not the other way around. So effectiveness is your core value. Go back over the list to see if you haven't missed any. When you've got this down to six values, ask friends and family if they think they, they reflect the way you live and the work you make. Keep going over the list until you can get it down to three life and three work values. OK, so if we can see the next slide, please. OK, now here's my list of life values. Now, 
you can have as many values on it as you like. I'm constantly adding to it. I think this is actually an old list now. It's much longer. It doesn't really matter. You just add things randomly. When people come up with ideas, just put them on. And what you do is you go through your list and just tick any value that you think is important to you. Then what you do is you go back through the list and you give those values a priority number of one to three. Of each one you've ticked, one to three, one being the most important, three being the least important. When you've done that, write all of those down on pieces of paper. I find it helps to write them down on small little bits of paper like post-it notes. I move those post-it notes around, those values around, until you can work out which are the most important, which are the six most important. You might get them quite quickly. It's unusual. Most people get them down to maybe 10 to 20 at the first go. But keep moving them around and keep questioning them. And then ask friends and family to help to see whether they are really a reflection of your values until you get them down to those three values. Now, this might take a bit of practice. It can take, a, you know, I redo this every few months to keep it fine tuned. Uh, sometimes I realise that one such slightly tips over into another. What you will find is when you've worked out what your key values are, they're always there. They've been there all your life. They've always been something that's really mattered to you. So when you know what those values are, you're able to make much better decisions about what you do in life. If you're asked to go and live, do a residency in, the, in an isolated spot on a hut on top of a mountain, and one of your values is to work with other people, it's probably not the right decision to make to take that residency. But actually, if you're, one of your values is solitude, then that probably is the right decision to make. So having a good sense of what your values are in life enables you to make much more accurate decisions about what is good for you. OK, next slide, please. Now, artwork values. These are the, the values that you have in your artwork, the three core values that are always present in your work. Again, there's a long list here. I, I keep adding to it. You do the same thing. Go through the list, tick the values that you think um, are important to you and then go back through that those ticks and give them a priority of one to three then write the number ones down and play around with them and then check them off the, the twos and the threes just to see if you haven't missed one and do the same again keep doing it until you get them down to your three core values so if we have the next slide please so here's mine so you can see on the left on my life values. They probably shouldn't surprise you given what I've just spoken about. Generosity matters to me, kind of sense of spiritualness and a sense of effectiveness. So what that means is, is that being generous in all that I do is one of my core values in life. So I should nurture it, look after it, care for it. And that should include what I give, how I see the world, by not judging others, supporting others and welcoming others. That a spiritual life is important to me, so a sense of wholeness, a time to contemplate and to be um, to, to meditate, meditate upon things, to be aware, to have a sense of awareness of myself, my community and the landscape in which I dwell, and a sense of nature, that being part of nature and a connectedness to nature is important to my well-being. Effectiveness is really important. I, I, I like things to work. I, whatever I do in life, whether that's making art, whether it's our support pledge or whether it's doing the gardening, I like to do it well. I like to do it in a way which is effective. I get results from doing it. But also within that, there are other values. So you can see under here, light touch, strategic preparedness, creativity, doing my best. They're all things I do to be effective. I find that doing things in a way which is not overly complicated and burdensome is a better way to be effective. So light touch matters. I'm quite good at being strategic. It's a sort of one of my life skills. So I'm quite good at strategizing an effective approach to doing things. Being prepared. I like that preparation for things, even preparing to make a painting. I enjoy 
making the surface of the painting. I enjoy doing the research for it and making drawings. Um, I enjoy preparing to go out on a run. All those things are, are, are sort of life skills that I've realized are, are important to me. They're part of my value system. And then on the right, you can see my work values. So I like work that is layered. So you can see the layers of color, pattern line, image. I like work to be have a sense of the haptic. So it's about a sense of touch. So it's surface, the marks on the surface, a sense of scratching on the surface and rubbing. They're all to me a kind of they engage that sense of the spiritual and a sense of generosity, that sense of giving, of the sense of touch, I think is important, the sense of generosity. And also in my work values is an enigma or something that's enigmatic. So it has a sense of mystery. It's elusive, it's ambiguous, but also a kind of, it's, a, it's at a point of transformation. It's transforming into something else. So now I, I know those values and I know my life values. When I make decisions about my work, I have a clearer sense about what I'm doing. And also if I am engaged in critique about my work, if somebody else says something about my work, if that helps make those values and manifest those values more clearly, it helps me to be a better Matthew Burroughs. If they distract from those values, then actually it's just probably helping me be a better version of them. So it's not really what I ought to be doing. So it's a good way of sort of establishing your own sense of identity and uh, confidence in how to make decisions about how you engage in the world, what you make your work with and of and when and how, but also how you deal with kind of critical dialogue about what you do. So uh, I'm not sure whether you um, you could screenshot these, but what I can do is I can actually just I'll send these to Matt. Um, just so he's got copies of them. Sense of in, Matthew. Sorry. So I will mention at the end that this talk is being recorded, and at the end, uh, Steph from marketing will put my email into the chat. He, uh, if you are interested in hearing anything more about the talk and seeing the recording, I will then email you the Chelsea blog, uh, which will have the talk uploaded to it. Uh, but um, Steph will put my email address into the chat at the end. Thank you. OK, so carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. That's great. OK, so I hope that's um, kind of given a little bit of insight into to some of the things I've learned over the years of being an artist. You could probably see I'm quite a strategic thinker. Um, it's just one of those skills I have. And so I I use it to try and help myself and others the best I can. Um, if you, I think maybe we, if you have any questions about this, uh, Matt, is there any questions about the uh, the values? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so if anyone can just uh, put their questions in uh, related to the values, and then what we'll do is we'll wrap things up. So I'm just gonna ask a couple of other questions that have come in. So a very hot topic in terms of people working from home at the moment. How would you advise to someone using their home slash kitchen in terms of their working practice? Yeah, I like that's a great question. Um, I think it's one of the sort of great takeaways is lockdown is how can you adapt? Uh, I've been very lucky in that I, I my studio is next door to my house. Um, so, I, you know, I've been able to access it all through lockdown. But I think one of the things is, is to look for challenge, look for opportunity within challenges. So to think about um, you know, if you have to work at the kitchen table, that's going to limit what you do. Well, within those limits, be as creative as possible. So even though I've got this, you know, a lovely big studio, because I've spent so much of my time in lockdown managing and maintaining our support pledge, largely I've made very small work because that sat within the limitations of the time I had available. But I always sort of think it's about saying, okay, they're the limitations I've got in this context. I'm going to be as creative as possible within those limitations um, and then enjoy that you know find some joy in those limitations rather than rather than um, lamenting the fact that you can't make big work at the moment try and find that sense of creative opportunity within the kitchen table studio excellent 
Um, so the next question, again, is something that we spoke about recently on the podcast. And uh, it's basically talking about the, the idea of pricing work at £200 um, and potentially cheapening the work. But the, the question also leads to the, the idea that making something that's £200, will it force people to make smaller work and therefore make artists work for a smaller amount? So that's interesting because that that touches upon what you mentioned previously in terms of the 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 art market in particularly the commercial art market whereby there'd be very high price points so i guess it's is a question directed at your idea of a, of a model that suits uh, an affordable art market somewhere where artists can actually put i mean such as myself i've purchased one of your works from the artist support pledge uh, because it because because I can afford to own a, a beautiful original work of art, Matthew. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Matt, and, uh, and thanks for buying this, that work. Um, yeah, I mean that's a kind of a multifaceted question, really. Yes, it 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 cheapens the work if you think cheapening the work matters. I see it the other way around. I see that it's a generous act to put my work at a lower price to support my friends and peers. Uh, and that's, you know, that at the very beginning, that's that was the origins of it. I thought because I was I'm putting work on at a lot lower value than the market value was pre lockdown. So I sort of felt like to generate money quickly to help support my friends and peers, I had to sell the work quickly. So it had to be cheaper than it would normally be. And yes, that does cheapen my market. But you know what? I'm living and I'm supporting many artists all over the world. And I'm happy with that. And if that cheapens me, fine. I don't mind being cheapened. Um, you know, and does it force people to to make smaller work? Well, probably, but I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, if it's it's not saying in a way, it's not, you know, I sell large scale works through a gallery as well for large sums of money. You know, I don't just sell work on our support pledge. It's not, you know, as Matt said earlier, it's not an alternative, it's an add-on. And there are artists on the pledge who are very well known established artists who are selling editions, prints on there. That's all fine because, you know, it is a market, it's an economy of mutual support and there'll be many people using it for many reasons. Um, but I think the ethos that it's done in it with an act of generosity is what really holds it all together. Excellent, thank you. So I think we're going to wrap things up now. Uh, we've just got to mention that Matthew guested on Morley Radio podcast Artcast, which is available on Morley Red Radio's website and app. The Artcast series will also be released on Spotify, uh, along with all of the other radio station platforms along Morley College. Uh, and all the series that have released on Morley Radio round about May slash June time. So they'll be on Spotify as well. Um, all that's left to say is uh, thanks so much, Matthew, for sharing your insights with us and talking to the students earlier today from the Chelsea Centre within Morley College. And all I've got to say, I've just got one more comment that's a really nice thing. Someone just said, I don't have a question, but just want to say a massive thank you to you. I found this talk very moving. You are a wonderful and inspiring person. Thank you so much. What a lovely comment to end on. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Excellent. That was great. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone.